All right, and welcome everybody back at another episode here. And this time we're going to cover group dynamics. Now, I know it's not the most thrilling name. I was actually kind of going back and forth on what exactly I wanted to call this. If I wanted to be more scientific, if I wanted to be more straightforward. Honestly, I could have just as easily called this whole presentation how to work in groups or working in groups, something to that effect. But, um, you know, I have to make it sound a little fancy. Don't know why, but just is what it is. Hopefully what you'll get out of this presentation is everything that you wish you'd learned about what it takes to actually successfully work in groups. A lot of people think it's, you know, straightforward as if there's some uh, sort of like easy formula. And frankly, this can apply to anybody all the way from, you know, high schoolers to teenagers to, uh, you know, young professionals like myself or career veterans. Really, this is very pivotal and foundational information that we'll be covering today about what it actually takes to effectively and successfully work in groups. So without further ado, let's get right into it. <clears throat> and, you know, just as a disclaimer again, all the photos and whatnot that I have on here uh, are not mine. If they are, um, I'll reference it as such, but I try to use Creative Commons photos as much as possible and no sponsors. All the work is my original own work, yada, yada, yada. So today, uh, by the end, what you'll hopefully understand is uh, actually being able to define and name all of the uh, Tuckman's uh, stages of group development and we'll cover just exactly what that is. Um, we'll hopefully also be able to explain the different parts of the brain and what they do and their names. Uh, you'll understand how information travels to and from the brain. You'll be able to list some examples of physiological responses and you'll also hopefully understand where and how to research more information on group dynamics and interpersonal relationships in order to help better educate yourself. This is not a one-stop shop and end-all be-all. This is meant really to provide you with a good strong foundation so you can springboard and do your own research. <clears throat> so just some really foundational stuff, right? When we talk about working and people in general, we're really referring to how it is that our brain functions uh, and how that in turn affects behavior and how environmental factors ultimately impact formations in the brain all the way from infancy to adolescence to adulthood. All of those uh, stages of development have a critical impact on the development of the brain and really the way that our brain communicates with uh, our body and vice versa, our body with our brain <clears throat> is through two main parts, uh, what we call central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system. So the CNS is our information highway where we have our spinal cord, which is uh, going right up to the brain and the brain can send uh, signals down there. And then from the spinal cord, we have the PNS, which is nerves branching and reaching to the other extremities of the body. So the important, it basically it's like, think of a tree trunk and the uh, branches and leaves. It's exactly the way uh, it's designed the same way. Uh, now, different types of stimuli activate and engage different parts of the brain. And of course that in turn activates various physiological responses. So what do I mean by physiological responses? Sweating, increased muscle blood flow, uh, increased adrenaline, constricted pupils, uh, heart racing, right? Uh, these are things that what signals our brain sends directly in, uh, impacts our physical uh, responses. And of course we can also have these physiological responses be activated depending on the environmental stimuli around us, right? So if there's danger about um, that can trigger certain physiological responses, you know, namely higher uh, adrenaline, <clears throat> so on and so forth. 
And the really fascinating thing in uh, human psychology is that even though we have the same four core uh, responses to stimuli, <clears throat> um, which are fight, flight, freeze, and fawn, uh, we're all familiar with fight, flight, and um, a lot of us might have heard freeze just for the first time, and it's exactly what it sounds like. There's an external stimuli, usually um, in, in nature, we might see this typically when there's a predator attacking a prey and it's food off for the prey to really do anything else to escape the situation. So all it does is it simply, um, you know, accepts the fate that has befallen it and quite literally the muscle response um, goes totally, uh, it just goes right out the window. In other words, they're not tensing up, they're not getting ready to run. <clears throat> they quite literally almost turn sort of the jello and um, they, they have no control of uh, over their uh, muscle reactions. Uh, fawn is another one. Um, and just to back up for a second for the freeze response, really what you can also see the freeze response uh, in situations where somebody has an increased level of anxiety. Typically what that means is they've had some sort of negative experiences that are very similar to the one happening just now. It might be that the environment is physically the same, but there's different individuals involved. And a lot of times the anxiety level will rise so much so that they will quite literally just freeze in place and they won't respond with any uh, with anything. <clears throat> you know, physically, they're just sort of, you know, they might stand upright, um, but they're not moving and they might be experiencing, you know, uh, cold sweats. So that's a physiological response in addition to their physical response of freezing. Um, <clears throat> Fawning is another type of behavior. It's actually quite uh, common to see it with uh, infants, especially when you look at uh, puppy dogs and how they behave around older adult dogs, where a lot of the times it's um, appeasement behavior, behavior, where you're fawning in order to get a desired uh, response from somebody else. And oftentimes, though, it's it's because there's a negative uh, stimuli awaiting if you uh, a negative response awaiting if you don't uh, take this appeasement approach. So oftentimes you'll see puppy dogs um, licking and grooming adult dogs, <clears throat> and and times that they know they've been particularly annoying and particularly frustrating, and they can see the adult dog is ready to snap at them, rightfully so. And so what do they do? They try to defuse the situation by appeasing and fawning. Um, humans also do this too. A lot of times it uh, comes out subconsciously where they will say things that they might not even have recollection of saying, or they will do things to um, appease another party because they either perceive, and it's important, a lot of these responses can be both um, from a perceived point of view where it's not actually happening, but in their brain, um, the signals are no less any, uh, no less uh, stronger and they're, you know, very much real within the brain as well as the body <clears throat> that, you know, something of uh, similarity has happened, uh, you know, previously in their life is also happening now, but it's not actually happening now. It's just uh, maybe some commonalities are present, say, you know, there was a negative experience they might have faced in a, in a particular park and they're back at that same park. However, you know, um, not the same people are not present. They're surrounded by friends and family and loved ones. And, you know, it's at a birthday party yet, you know, whatever negative experience they might have had just so happened to occur at that park. Um, yet, that you know triggers a appease, uh, appeasement or fawning response, so they'll behave in a certain manner that they uh, towards an individual or a collective group of individuals that they otherwise normally would not be uh, responding to that way. Um, and you know, as, as it states there, it's really a subconscious safety-seeking response, and it's trying to uh, predict what it is that the other person might want or need 
in order for you to feel safe, not so much that there's actually any sort of threat present. And that's the fascinating thing about um, the nervous system and the brain and physiological responses. They occur, these various signals and responses occur regardless of whether something's actually happening or not. <clears throat> and different people have different thresholds for what they're able to tolerate and as well as what they're able to um, sort of rebound back from, right? Where some people, if they've uh, had a particularly negative experience, they have a different propensity to really come back from it. Um, some might come back stronger, others not so much. And so it's important to realize that the all the four core responses, the stimuli are there, right? Fight, flight, freeze, and fawn. The spectrum is uh, people's ability to sort of uh, handle the different stimuli and and not just in the moment, but afterwards as well. Um, how they cope, how they manage um, worldviews, they might develop behaviors, um, other uh, uh, adaptations they might have uh, that otherwise would not have uh, kicked in before the um, before the. Uh, uh, incident occurred. And so <clears throat> the nervous system, right? So we talked about the two communication highways where brain, spinal cord, and, um, you know, tree trunk, and then branches, the PNS, peripheral nervous system, right, branching out. So what, uh, what, what are the areas of the brain that sort of handle these uh, different um, tasks in communicating with different parts of the body and how they um, and impact in different parts of the body depending on what signals. So we really have three core parts. Um, we have the cortex and of course there's a uh, prefrontal cortex and there's different parts of the uh, cortex as well. We have which handles primarily intellectual tasks. Um, so things like uh, ma analytical, you know, planning, um, very log logical sequencing, Th those types of things is what our cortex is responsible for. Um, we have our reptilian uh, part of our brain, which is really instinctual behavior. And then we also have our, our limbic system, which regulates and manages emotional behavior. The fascinating thing about the brain, of course, it's evolved over millions and millions of years. And without exception, everybody has these three parts. Um, there are obviously instances where somebody might have um, deformities with a certain part or they're slightly smaller and another part might be slightly bigger uh, than normal and those definitely impact um, not only people's propensity to handle certain stimuli but overall behaviors and various other medical conditions that potentially might come with it. Um, but really what I want you to take away from this slide is there's such a common, very common and false belief that every decision that we as humans make is always purely rational and logical. And this is not the case whatsoever because it implies that essentially we only have one part to our brain and it's the cortex and the brain is just only made up of our cortex. And if that were the case, then humans would really have little to no uh, emotion uh, or irrational behavior whatsoever. We would be thinking purely like a machine, which empirically we know is absolutely wrong. And I can't tell you how many times, not only from coworkers, uh, I've seen this, but also other fellow um, instructors who truly do believe and live in this manner that all human behavior is purely coming from a rational and logical perspective and it is never the case it is why a lot of the conversations around how stem uh, innovates and how we can make technologies better ex exclusively for the vast majority of time and by vast majority of time i don't mean 51 percent or 60 percent i'm i'm talking like 90 to 95 percent right so that five percent difference of where people do take into account is totally negligible because there's such a bigger percentage at play here that um, totally disregards the fact that, you know, the human brain 
is not just this purely analytical and logical um, entity. It does, in fact, have various parts to it, and rightfully so. They serve a different purpose, and it's not like one is better than the other. Humans have always been, forever will continue to be social creatures. And what I want you to get again out of this is that context is also is always important. Um, different internal from person to person, right? And external environment, uh, environmental stimuli will absolutely affect uh, and engage different parts of the brain. For some people, a particular stressor, immediately they have a higher propensity to look at it from a in a local perspective, whereas others will have a more emotional perspective and others will have a more gut instinctual perspective, namely fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. That's very, very important. And it's why depending on the folks that you work with, depending on not only their own career backgrounds, but their types of personalities that they might have, um, different hobbies and interests and uh, perspectives and values they hold, that absolutely plays a role in how their nervous uh, their nervous system operates versus your nervous system and what they respond to positively versus yours. This is really try, uh, what I'm really trying to do here is sh shift the age old approach of attitudes and platitudes to neuroscience and legitimate evidence based frameworks. And it all comes from understanding the nervous system and the human brain. Um, another key takeaway here is really most human behaviors actually occur subconsciously. You know, at, at the very least, the primary ones that result in our uh, being able to live. So things like your breathing, your resting heart rate are all driven by your re reptilian brain. So these are what we call egoic behaviors. Um, and again, you might have heard the word ego, which is a lot of subconscious um, values and behaviors that you really don't automatically have full control over and full understanding over um, just off the gate. People need to actually be uh, actively coached, taught, and um, help, help in order to assisted in order to adapt away some of the negative response they have in order to actually learn more positive uh, and pro-social manners of interacting. So it's why you might see people um, saying silly nonsense or behaving in irrational manners. And most of the time it does in fact come from subconscious behaviors, from the ego from their reptilian part of their brain. And it's primarily because they haven't really um, worked through uh, understanding some of those uh, behaviors and how different stimuli um, activate um, different parts of their brain and what they have a tendency to respond towards. It is, people have, you know, we're, we're born with an innate propensity and ability for the most part to uh, master and learn to manage and adapt these uh, behaviors and systems, but the vast majority of people um, do not have that, you know, innate ability to just do so without any sort of uh, uh, coaching or assistance off the gate. Most people do in fact need it, and it's not just a one-off, you know, you take one workshop and you're done. It's over many, many, many years. And in fact, when you look at, um, uh, Develop, uh, development in humans from childhood uh, childhood to teenagehood to uh, young adulthood, there's different stages uh, that they, that there's different parts of their brain that they're able to more closely relate with. And uh, a common thing that you see very often with uh, children is that they're very strongly tied to their egoic behaviors. You know, it's oftentimes a very uh, self focused manner of being where only they uh, only their perspective is being taken into account and also they rightly justify their own behaviors uh, because they feel a need they don't really know where that need or want comes from but they feel it and so therefore 
they uh, innately automatically um, act on that need and on that want. These are the types of things that people learn bit by bit through development, but there's more fine tuning to be done as you enter the age of adulthood, as different parts of your brain further develop, as um, you're able to understand uh, uh, things like consent and what that means to uh, to be able to express and give consent for an adult versus uh, a, a young adult versus somebody in their you know late 30s versus 40s versus 50s and for a lot of people actually um, I, the the brain as a whole doesn't really fully form and finish developing until their late 20s which is really to say that um, specifically the ability to understand and manage a lot of these egoic behaviors really um, doesn't uh, that that full ability doesn't really uh, kick in until we're about 27 28 and as humans are uh, living longer that age is being pushed back ever so slightly and so it's it's a very important thing to take into account that a lot of these subconscious behaviors um, people aren't really being able to take full um, being able to take full action to understanding them because the brain is not quite yet fully formed um, and so they have a higher propensity it doesn't mean they all so the difference here right i i, I want to stress the importance of propensity which is you know the ability uh to which is a potential to act on something but it doesn't all doesn't it's not a guarantee that you're always going to act uh in, in that particular manner you just might have a higher likelihood but it's not a guarantee so that's what i mean when i say propensity So the information highway, right? We talked about the CNS and we talked about the uh, PNS, and this is just giving you a more holistic overview of really how that looks like in the body, right? We talked about physiological responses before, um, and really these are from our para, uh, parasympathetic nerves, right? So we talked about constricting uh, pupils or dilated pupils. Uh, we talked about inhibiting uh, well, another physiological response could be, you know, inhibiting glucose, especially in uh, particularly uh, stressful situations. You you'll find people have higher uh, levels of adrenaline, and adrenaline does uh, and has certain impacts on the body, uh, regardless of it's actually a you know life or death situation. Again, going back to perceived versus uh, ac real actual events. Uh, the important takeaway from this photo, aside from just showing you, uh, you know, various other um, physiological responses, as well as the architecture of our nerves themselves, which you see here on the right hand uh, on the right hand photo, is what the brain explicitly cannot remember as memories, the body, in fact, does. So this is what I meant by that example where, say you're walking about your local park, maybe 10 years ago you had a negative experience, right? Your, uh, you know, an apple could have fallen out of the tree and hit you so hard on the head, it just kind of clonked you out for a minute. And then you woke up, you weren't sure what happened, but, you know, let's just say that really uh, influenced you in a deep, deep manner. And now 10 years, you know, fast forward 10 years, you're walking by that same park and it happens to be that you're coming up to the tree where this, you know, ginormous <laughs> ungodly apple fell on your tree and clonked you out. Um, as you're approaching the tree, you'll find that even though you intellectually and in your brain might not have been able to store that memory to you, it's just another tree and it's you know it's just another apple your body senses that it's the same spot with the same type of apples that hurt you in this particular manner all those 10 years ago and so our physiological responses actually often occur unconsciously through the body and it goes both for positive and negative experiences and um 
As for what our body does and does not remember, unfortunately, we have no control over that. But what we can do is we can actually help the body sort of unlearn the potentially negative manners of uh, being and instead learn new ways of adaptation. And um, a lot of this is where we tap into using both, uh, not, not just our uh, reptilian brain, but also our cortex to help uh, intellectually and logically train our bodies um, through various ver uh, frameworks. You know, one manner of which is um, you can help somebody be re-exposed to the same stimuli in a very controlled and safe manner. Um, right in this case, you might just have somebody sort of circle the tree a couple of times. You might even have them wear a really strong, you know, industrial uh, safety helmet uh, as they're walking by that, just so their body learns that, you know, this this particular stimuli is not negative all the time, right? And, you know, generally, too, uh, our brain and body does, in fact, have a bias, uh, a stronger bias for remembering negative stimuli. And the reason for this is an evolutionary uh, biological reason for survival. And for better or for worse, it is what it is that, um, you know, our brains and bodies behave this way through, you know, uh, um, years and years and years of evolution. Um, it's it's a it's something that has clearly allowed us to survive and adapt for the better to have the ability to uh, sort of remember stimuli in this manner. And by remember, I use it loosely, of course, because I'm talking about subconscious memory. So that was a lot. I just wanted to throw that all out there. Um, and really what I wanted to take away from all of that, from talking about brain development, the different parts of the brain, how information gets to and from our brain and our body, how our body remembers things that a brain really might not, is neuroscience is vastly important and it goes hand in hand with social psychology. And it goes hand in hand with understanding current events, historical events, as well as culture and ways in which people interact and behave individually versus collectively, and especially more so when it's a, a group collaboration, you know, the way that they interact with certain folks versus other folks, regardless of the fact that they're, you know, still in a group environment. And what it really means is a lot of the pre-existing culture impacts every facet of how work is done, individually and collectively. And past experiences, as we've just learned, absolutely do shape the present through subconscious behavior and thoughts. The important takeaway here is that these, sub, uh, these subconscious behaviors and thoughts are just that. They're subconscious. It means they we can't just automatically think them away and they go away. It is exactly why, um, you know, somebody, it's exactly why somebody that might be experiencing certain physiological responses associated with a uh, fight or flight, you know, life or death situation, even though they're currently not in that same situation, they're in fact, you know, at a water cooler, for example, it doesn't matter. Perception of stimuli is just as real both to the brain and the body <clears throat> as the very event itself when it did in fact happen it's a very very important takeaway here further just as important is it does not mean that they cannot be changed these uh, subconscious behaviors and thoughts can in fact be changed you know, responses to ideas, are you open-minded and are you able to at least entertain them and to explore them without a feeling of threat of attacking who you are as, an, as a person and what you stand for? Um, can you tolerate differences in behavior? Say, you know, you have a Knicks uh, fan versus a not Knicks fan. And can you tolerate them within uh, a group environment? 
uh, what, what sort of biases do you have, right? Explicit biases are ones that we're conscious of and we apply them versus implicit ones are uh, subconscious. And a lot of times, you know, it comes up and we only know after the fact, but while it's happening, we're not really aware of it. It doesn't mean, though, that these things cannot be changed. And it doesn't mean that even though somebody might have a higher propensity to do something or uh, might have a lower propensity to be resilient, it doesn't mean that they cannot be resilient. It does not mean that their behaviors uh, cannot be changed and adapted in a positive and pro-social manner. It just means, really, it takes work. You can't just think your way out of it. It takes lots of dedicated work. And again, the vast majority of people really operate in an egoic and subconscious manner. And what that means is whenever, say, an idea comes about, instead of seeing it for what it is as just simply an idea, right, they see it quite literally as a visceral attack on who they are as an individual and what their values are their friends, family, loved ones, quite literally, they see it in that uh, and experience it in that visceral, physical um, manner. So they have, you know, responses to uh, ideas that somebody else would not have, and they, you know, have a higher propensity to be negative. This is where it gets interesting. Um, there's so much that I could really say here, but the fat the, the the thing of it all is when we talk about management leadership and neuroscience it matters it used to be the case people thought a manager could be a leader de facto and a leader could be anybody especially more so if they were the stereotypical archetype of uh, a charismatic and loud and boisterous speaking person that as if somehow that automatically made them a, uh, a suitable leader. And it does not. And I'm going to explain to you exactly why. Management and leadership are using totally different parts of the brain. And the cool thing is that anybody can manage. And predominantly it's because these are... Um, very these are tasks that involve heavy heavy use of executive and cognitive functions again we talk about analytics right uh logist uh, logic sequential planning right step one step two step three uh these are things that most people can do and we actively all learn how to do throughout our entire years of schooling as especially at home we learn uh everything from how to make our bed uh, you know, how, how to cook, how to put on our shoes, right? How uh, we get in our car, go to work. We learn these things and they don't really take much, uh, a lot of times much thought other than putting together all the pieces in logical sequence. Leadership, on the other hand, uh, actually totally uses, uh, again, a different part of the brain and it's actually localized in the limbic system. And it requires heavy use of intuition, uh, motivation. Um, I would add to here as well, uh, uh, dedication and commitment because motivation can be fleeting. Whereas if you have a routine and if you are uh, committed and show discipline, that is more than just a fleeting feeling. That is shown to be time proven, consistent, regardless of what the environmental circumstances are. So leadership takes discipline, management does not. And it involves using um, other skills. Leadership uses a lot of social and emotional processes. And uh, really, I, I want to stress here that it's more than just being emotional, right? And it's also more than just being boisterous and the stereotypical, um, you know, domineering and um, boisterous type of personality you need an effective leader can actually use uh, emotional intelligence specifically for the purposes of proactively communicating to effectively 
help not just themselves, but other people by building trust, managing conflicts, exploring ideas without taking it so personally that they feel it's an attack and, uh, and a threat to their uh, individual um, selves and their way of being in life itself. Managers, again, uh, who are used to doing the traditional management tasks do not have uh, many instances where they are really challenged to exercise uh, that part of their brain, quite literally. Um, it just, they're in, often in an environment where they don't really have a need to. And so that's the way the brain works, right? It's exactly in that. You need to exercise that part of the brain in order to learn and adapt. You can't, you know, we have the innate ability to de develop and grow, but it does not mean that by default we're, we're born with these skills. We have to really train, uh, be taught through repetition, through experiences to uh, effectively use them. And that's really what makes the difference. Uh, and you, you can't just be a manager or a leader. You have to learn how to effectively be both, which is to say you really need to do the long and arduous work of emotional regulation, understanding uh, your uh, propensities and pre mis uh, preconceptions, explicit and implicit biases, and understand how your nervous system operates with certain stimuli and uh, give you uh, certain physiological responses and exploring why that is. And many people do not do that. And it's why that um, the adage exists for anybody can be a manager, but not everybody can be a leader. Uh, it's also the, the, the case with leadership is a, a lot of the folks that do make very effective leaders have this intrinsic desire, um, this internal locus that drives them to be of help to others. And not only that, but they have this um th this pull they don't just do it for the sake of getting self-gratification exclusively there is some level of self-gratification they have but they do it primarily because they want to learn how to be of more help to other people and and how uh and they use that oftentimes as a way to learn more about themselves, which innately uh, is more than just the fleeting feeling of gratification, but also builds them up as an individual through various skills that they learn. Um, they also unlearn, they might unlearn some negative uh, responses and behaviors. And through ex this exploration, they learn new ways of adaptation. Uh, so very, very wonderful and wonderful and powerful stuff here when we talk about how neuroscience really is at the foundation of management and leadership, truly. Um, something of equal importance here is, yes, you know, we've learned so far people can change, uh, people can unlearn. you all on its own but there are in fact cases uh and instances where unfortunately it really doesn't matter uh how how much effort and resources others um uh, or your environment fosters to help people learn some of these positive ways uh, of being and uh, learning things like this you know how our brain is formed and whatnot and um in the, particularly, I'm, I'm referring to character disturbed individuals where um, regardless if they have a formal diagnosis or not, a lot of people want to instantly jump into, you know, well, do they have a clinical diagnosis of a personality disorder? Um, it does not matter. Truly, it does not matter. When I refer to individuals who are character disturbed, specifically, again, it doesn't matter if they have a formal clinical diagnosis, but I'm talking about repetition in, uh, of behavior and a pattern that follows 
especially a pattern regardless of the environment they are in. Uh, and, you know, uh, people that, you know, if they're in one in, in particular environment, um, they have a drive to instead of help other people uh, and, you know, learn more about them, they have a drive to sort of manipulate, control a situation. And then they're, say, in a, another situation where they are given a lot of uh, freedom and power uh, to do basically anything they wish. And instead of, again, uh, learning more about their subconscious ways of being and how different stimuli affect them, they double or triple down on that same controlling and manipulating behavior. This is how we get really terrible misapplication and total misunderstanding of uh, pro-social management and leadership methods. This is how we get complete misinterpretation and uh, disregard of individual and collective group behaviors, right? They apply the same pattern of behavior regardless of the environment. Oftentimes you'll see this expressed as platitudes, very vapid behavior, um, self-centeredness, a lot of hypocritical remarks. Um, and really what it does is it, it serves to mask their own character deficiencies, their own weaknesses, um, and they often do this in a relentless pursuit of self-fulfillment at, uh, at the expense of others, knowing too very well that they don't have to follow this path, but they do so anyway. And again, the importance here is that regardless of a, whether there's a clinical diagnosis or not, it's the pattern of behavior, regardless of the environment, is consistent and the same. That's the important takeaway here. So moving on. All right. So we're coming up now on the part which I like to say, you know, so we build, we have our building blocks, we know about the brain, um, we know how different things might impact our brain and our body, we learn a little bit about cases where some people just, you know, are really sort of beyond help and, you know, might actively uh, or, you know, subconsciously at least, be refusing to adapt and change. Um, all that stuff is good, but that's really focused on the individual. This is the part of the presentation that we actually talk about the group. So with that in mind, who is Dr. Bruce Tuckman? So really, to, to make a long story short, he developed what's called the Tuckman Stages of Group Development, and it shows the phases that uh, people go through when they come together in groups. As long as there's more than one person within the same vicinity, that's a group. Multiple people, right? More than one, you have a group. Uh, also, uh, we'll, we'll see a slide coming up here to show you um, those phases of the groups. What I want you to remember is that uh, these stages do not happen in sequential order. It is not necessarily the case that they happen in a logical, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six uh, set of steps. It does not happen that way. Oftentimes what actually happens is you jump from one to another. It's exactly like when we refer to the stages of grief. Um, some people might never actually come out of one stage. Same thing happens here. Um, some people might go from one to, uh, you know, and progress to another, but then they revert right back to um, that previous phase. Or some people might skip certain phases altogether and, you know, sort of jump to the end. It is totally uh, not guaranteed that you sort of go through each of the steps in a nice, perfectly logical, sequential manner. Very important. Most people don't get that. So just want to be very, very important uh, and clarify that. And really the stages. Um, oh, and also if a new member comes in or even if an existing member leaves the group, same thing. The group, uh, even though they're at a particular stage, um, they might very well jump back to the very uh, to yet another completely different stage. Or they might say forever be stuck in that stage or they're currently at. Um, until somebody, you know, again, leaves, you know, internal factors or external forces um, impact the group. 
these really, though, give you the ground to understand just how it is that people behave in groups. These are the stages that human beings go through when interacting in groups. And we'll see that in the photo here. So we have forming, storming, norming, performing, adjourning. And uh, the uh, I'll actually explain. So with norming, there's actually uh, sort of an iterative process there. But think of this uh, if, if it helps you remember the, the visual. You know, aside from the cool name you can mention, honestly, I don't know how <laughs> he came up with something that uh, rhymes and, you know, goes so well. But think of uh, if you've ever seen hens and chicks, uh, th think of the pecking order. This is exactly what that's like, uh, except, you know, given more concrete verbiage. So a lot of people like to think of, um, you know, going from one so if we were to give these a number, call forming one, storming two, norming three, you know, performing four, adjourning five. Um, there's really two iterative steps you do at norming. There's norming and renorming. Um, so if that helps you, you know, in put it in a logical sequence, there it is. Uh, but really, what we have at the beginning here is forming, which is exactly how it sounds like people are meeting either for the first time or they're people that are familiar with each other and they learn about really this is where they're learning about the opportunities and challenges of what the group is being called uh, to to do right here is where they agree to work on goals and actually then set out to do the work oftentimes what you find when people are at this stage is they're very motivated to do the work but they're not really a collective group unit just yet. They're really working independently and, you know, together but separate sort of thing where, again, they're physically together uh, or in another, you know, in modern times, they might be a remote uh, group, but they're really behaving independently, right, which is to say they have their own silos of work that they do um, and there might be reluctant to share some of that uh, information. And it's really nothing to do with um, direct personal uh, uh, views uh, of the group per se or any one individual, but it's primarily because they're unsure of what they're expected to do uh, or they might just be uninformed uh, of some of the issues at hand, you know, what the objectives might be, expectations not only of them, but of the team. So that's really where people are at in this particular phase. And now, if they made it through this phase successfully, um, then really what you have, and really typically forming, um, unless there's a new person being added, that's typically the only time that folks might be stuck in this particular case, right? You know, is there another human body being added to this collective? If not, then, you know, they, they usually progress uh, beyond this phase. And uh, next up, we have what's called storming. And here what we have is, you know, conflict is arising as power and status are being assigned, right? Depending on what uh, dominance hierarchy is chosen. Um, if, you know, if it's a top down type of structure, all that is important. And here you see people uh, voicing individual opinions. Um, work might be done in the form of uh, trust building exercises to build trust with uh, among teammates. Some people might feel like a lot of excitement. Others might be really eager to, you know, get ready and keep going and you know crank out work um they might be just overall really positive but on the other hand a lot of people might just as equally feel um, suspicion a lot of fear and anxiety and this really all goes back to uh the fact that people have different propensities to adapt and manage different stimuli differently it, it really depends on the individual and what their experiences are you know, 
you know, and oftentimes in this, uh, this is where a lot of disagreements and personality clashes arise. And uh, honestly, some groups might never actually progress out of the stage. Um, it's your job as a leader really to uh, describe the tasks, uh, better understand behaviors and help your team also understand the behaviors of their respective teammates. Uh, and then ultimately teach others uh, and how to deal and handle complaints as well as you know you asserting your um, your appropriate authority to manage and deal those uh, and handle those complaints. Something you're find in this phase is you know tolerance and patience are really your keys to success. Um, just as the, the old adage says, sometimes you have to ride the storm out. It's really no different in this case. If you're able to make it through that and um, get to the next part, which is uh, what I like to call our iterative part of this whole uh, cycle, it's what we call norming. This is where um, people begin to express more tolerance and accepting uh, acceptance of personality, uh, personalities and behavioral quirks of their respective team members. And it's all with the active effort of moving on, you know, to accomplish a common goal. Uh, it's really important to take away here is that some people might be really hyper focused on preventing conflict as opposed to um, in into the degree that they're actually sometimes avoiding conflict altogether. And there is a time and place to avoid conflict as an active, you know, conflict management practice. But in this case, what I'm talking about is Regardless of what the uh, instance is, you know, you might see people actively choosing conflict avoidance always, regardless of what uh, the circumstances are. So just be mindful of that. Um, uh, and, you know, oftentimes what you can get here as norms or, you know, cultural and behavioral norms are being uh, set and agreed upon by the team and um, being worked through, you might have. Um, you know, a, a reluctancy of sharing ideas and feedback, especially if people are um, reluctant to address conflict or, you know, actually uh, dive into a group effort with conflict because conflict does in fact you know, drive, uh, can drive innovation and uh, disrupt a stagnation uh, of, of work and ideas overall. So conflict is not inherently always bad it's just there's a difference in views and of opinions and it needs to be reconciled in some manner sometimes that means you avoid it and you know there's not always a perfect solution although people have a stronger tendency to want um some sort of best solution myself included um but it's really helping educate people that sometimes that might not be the case and there might never be a perfect solution and um, just helping under, uh, people understand that and working through that not only what it means for them individually but for the uh, group collectively uh, then we get to my personal favorite performing right where we worked out a lot of these cultural uh, differences and we understand each other on a deep and intimate level and now we're really just getting getting straight to the work or you know or grinding it out um roles roles are defined expectations are set there's a common and clear goal the team is motivated they're knowledgeable not only about um what they're doing but they feel confident in their expertise uh and really at this point they're often autonomous they are um self-organized uh they're self-driven they know who they need to contact to get a particular to get access to a particular resource, all that good stuff. Things we all want to, uh, you know, see from our teams. Sometimes, um, uh, and what when you know people are really doing the work, um, so dissent is is allowed, especially sometimes it's encouraged if channeled through the appropriate means. 
uh, that the team might have agreed upon during norming, right? If there's an issue that uh, comes up with the work itself or an issue with a particular team member, you know, say, say something is going on with that team member at home and it's uh, impacting the way that they are um, working in the workplace, you know, we can address that at this point in an appropriate manner and we uh, channel it through appropriately rather than having um, no sort of channel communication to uh, address that. We get to uh, the iterative part as we're you know doing work. Really, we're going to find that what we established before as norms was a function of what we knew today. So what that means is that we are back to really norming and renorming again. For example, uh, there might be uh, an instances where a team or even the team leader is being too co too content with subpar performance levels. Um, obviously, this prevents the team from reaching their full potential and actually achieving um, uh, objectives. So, readdressing that sometimes that might be an actual you know team member bringing up the issue as opposed to the uh, team lead at this point people feel confident uh, enough to bring up these issues and um, without a fear of um, retaliation or without a fear of there's going to be some sort of negative consequence if they uh, address this cultural norm that seems to be setting in of accepting subpar performance. And then the uh, really the, the true final phase is the, the work is complete uh, and the group ultimately needs to be disbanded, right? There was a task at hand, it was completed within a certain timeline. And like any uh, you know, project work, right? It, it's unique in, in, and it's also time bound. There's a definitive start and stop time. Um, oftentimes what you find in this phase, and it doesn't necessarily mean that these people will never work together as a group, um, but the fact that the group came together for achieving a particular task, right? That was a unique task. Project work is unique. So while they might come together again um, for other work, it's not going to be the same, and that's okay. That's to be expected. But it doesn't mean that that unsameness is bad. It just means it's just that. It's not the same as it was before. You know, you're not making the same widget in the, in this time around. So uh, that's okay. Oftentimes, um, what you'll find as you are going through the a journey phase with your team uh, is. Uh, it can actually lead to a lot of uh, depression and, and anxiety. You know, naturally, again, people are social creatures, so they're always wanting to connect, uh, and in this case, reconnect with their team leads. Sometimes, though, uh, a permanent adjourning of adjourning of that team is best because those people are really <laughs> just rode the wave and completed the work and never want to see each other, and that's fine too. It's not the case that they have to see each other. Um, and be on good buddy buddy terms. It's you know just a natural part of uh, of a journey. Um, so there you have it. Those are Tuckman stages of group development and what every human experiences um, whenever they're working in groups of people. And again, just remember, it's not that teams go from forming, storming directly to storming, directly to norming, directly to performing then directly to norming and renorming, and then immediately to adjourning. Oftentimes you'll find team forms, they immediately jump to performing, task gets done, adjourn. No uh, unspoken norms and uh, cultural ways of interacting as a group are set. That's okay too. It's not set in stone that you need to go through all these uh, phases in a distinct and explicit manner for a team to be effective, but they do go through these stages. And how it looks like for them, you know, will be very unique to the circumstances and individuals uh, who are involved in the actual making of the group. But they do uh, go through these stages 
whether uh, explicitly or implicitly. On this slide here, what I wanted to give you is just a really uh, a nice list of social scientists that have helped frame a lot of the uh, scientific understanding of how humans interact in groups, both from understanding humans as individuals and as well of um, seeing how people inter interact as groups. A lot of these folks um, and many of their uh, counterparts have done research from observing infants, right, to uh, adolescents, teenagers, young adults, etc. And uh, probably some of the more common names you've seen are, um, if not the scientists themselves, well, many people have definitely heard of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. We'll be covering that in the upcoming slide here. Um, that was by, of course, Abraham Maslow. Um, there's also Frederick Hertzberg and uh, we talk about the hygiene factors and motivating agents for people in the workplace. Um, there's also McGregor with this 3X and 3Y. Weechi was actually uh, an American uh, social scientist who really kind of uh, added a very much needed uh, part to McGregor's sort of very binary view of the world and talked about a, a theory Z. Um, Philip Crosby, we've covered him in a uh, another session with what is quality management. His whole uh, thing was quality is free, right? We have the plan, do, check, act, which is very sequential traditional waterfall, right? You plan everything up front and then you do th everything according to the plan. There's also the Pareto principle. Uh, I believe this guy was an Italian uh, scientist. 80-20 rule. 80% of the problems are caused by 20% of the things. 80% of the revenue is coming from 20% of the customers. That sort of thing. Um, one of my personal favorites, Joseph Duran. Change, real lasting change, uh, comes from all aspects of the dominance hierarchy. Above, below, horizontally, and across. So you need all. And then, of course... Uh, we have another very interesting tidbit uh, called Parkinson's Law, which is to say that work expands to fill the time available for its completion. So if you have a month for doing something, even though that task uh, might actually just take you, you know, a week and a half, it's not going to take you the full month to do. And it's uh, especially important when we talk about agile uh, ways of project management. So really cool stuff. Um, so again, some of these guys we've covered, you can check the uh, session on what is project management as well as uh, what is quality management. And on to the next one. So really, really cool thing. Um, when we talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, of needs, we're talking about the individual. So just, you know, to sort of frame your brain for a second. We talked a little earlier about um, physiological responses. So really at the base of this uh, triangle of needs is physiological needs for basic biological survival. Food, water, shelter. Safety needs, right? Security, safety. Are you in active harm, right? Are you working in a place where um, the situations always call for a life or death instance? Uh, we have psychological needs. This is uh, sort of shifting both to individual and collective. Um, really, this entire triangle applies to the individual as well as the group. But these are things like, you know, are you able to have some sense of accomplishment, um, reward, uh, as well as a working, being in an environment that fosters and allows and enables you to uh, actively share ideas without you always feeling like you're walking on eggshells or reluctance, right? And at the top, we have um, self-fulfilling needs, which is self-actualization of, you know, you have this innate drive, say, to sort of, quote, unquote, want to change the world, but you want to do it in a way that is unique to you. And some people, you know, might be an artist, other people they might be building, you know, hybrid uh, 
diesel engines that run on electric batteries and they want to do it for cheap and they want to do it in a sustainable manner uh, with you know open source uh, hardware and software really depends on the individual but um, somebody that's self-actualized understands that those, not only understands that the, the, these are their drives um, but they understand how to effectively work with others in a pro-social and positive manner to make it happen where it's mutually beneficial. Really the key takeaway from this uh, is, I, I just wanted to show uh, folks that, you know, one cannot effectively channel their energy and efforts into productivity without first getting their basic needs met. Regardless of if it's the workplace, personal home and family life, or really anywhere else, if there's no physi uh, physiological um, basic needs, food, water, shelter, you're not going to be focused on, you know, achieving peak uh, software engineering performance and cranking out the most lines of code with code with um, high quality code at every point in turn. It's just not possible. If your, you know, organization is completely down uh, downturning and say there's really not no other employers in your area and you have family and kids to feed you're not thinking about being the best elite level uh solutions architect on the particular project if you are in an environment that is actively you know saying one thing but doing quite the opposite you know we're open to ideas and they completely shut down every idea doesn't matter <laughs> doesn't matter that a particular task needs to be done. Folks are just not gonna be uh, connected to that and able to perform because those basic needs are not met. I would also add in this, um, it's a little outdated image. I wish I'd find a better one, but those basic needs really include um, psychological needs as well. Self-actualization is something that people grow and learn, grow into and learn over time. But what people need uh, truly are achieving, uh, or being in a place that uh, achieves the psychological as well as physiological basic needs for safety. Um, so here we have the motivation hygiene and dual factor theory. This is from Hertzberg. And so, uh, Really what this means is, you know, certain factors exist in every work. I would change that not just to workplace, but really, really any environment, regardless of if it's job or not. Any environment that causes dissatisfaction, right? Certain factors exist there. While yet another set of factors uh, cause dissatisfaction and they can all act independent of each other. So just to, um, help paint a better picture here. When we talk about hygiene factors, these are the environmental and contextual factors, external, right? So for job, that would be salary, working conditions, company policies, uh, that sort of thing. For motivators, these could be more intrinsic fa uh, factors related to uh, the, the task or uh, or the job at hand, right? Are there any um, levels of recognition, uh, responsibilities that you as an individual get to take on aside from working in a group that has some responsibilities, but do you as an individual, are you being tasked with anything? Um, is there any opportunities for growth and upward mobility? Those are the kinds of things uh, when we talk about motivators versus uh, hygiene. And basically, uh, this wonderful work here was done on a study in the 50s, and he basically asked employers, uh, excuse me, employees to describe instances in which they felt uh, particularly satisfied or dissatisfied. And um, one of the criticisms often uh, you, you might often hear with uh, dual factor theory is that it's often focusing on individual factors rather than contextual factors. So what I mean by that is there's often a reluctance to um, to address, you know, sort of other societal uh, factors at play that 
are outside of you know your small collective unit right yes you work at this place and there's a job there but is there a government strife or war happening at the same time that you're also in your job those things do in fact even though they're on a more global scale they absolutely impact uh, both motivators and uh, hygiene factors so that's what one of the biggest criticisms of um, this I see it more of a, a sort of a rough tool belt, a tool in your tool belt to paint a really rough uh, picture. And then of course you apply um, external contacts as necessary, but it's nonetheless, it is still a very good uh, social psychology tool to use uh, to understand individual and uh, group dynamics. Uh, theory X and theory Y leadership. Uh, there's also a, quite a bit of um, controversy around this, but I, really what when we talk about uh, McGregor, he uh, ultimately summarizes that there's sort of two ways of uh, approaching people. And um, really it's the way that a manager's attitude, you know, exists uh, both in front of their direct uh, 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 cohort on which they are a, a super they have authority over as well as among peers that behavior and attitude has direct and in, indirect impacts on uh, employee motivation there's a book there you can check it out uh, but mcgregor really talks about theory x attitude of a manager uh, assumes that the manager sees uh, employees valuing uh the amount of money they make as their primary source of motivation um uh, they uh, theory x attitude is one where you know work is inherently distasteful because it takes time that they otherwise could have been spent doing something else that they value more so uh theory x attitude assumes that people will attempt to avoid work whenever possible and that certainly is true for some uh circumstances but Again, you know, my personal take on it is really the vast majority of the time that is not the case. Um, Theory X also assumes most people are not ambitious, you know, meaning they want to do as little as possible for not the most amount of reward. Um, some cases that is true, oftentimes it is not. Uh, it argues that there is little desire for responsibility and um, this uh, attitude prefers to um, see people as needing to be directed and um, it sees people as having no creative aptitude in solving problems. You know, oftentimes the way I've seen Theory X frameworks be used effectively is if there's a particularly difficult uh, team member involved, usually it's an individual just, um, and you know, sometimes implementing these levels of control and direct, you know, purview can in fact be effective. Um, oftentimes though, it's not. Um, and if we take a look at the uh, Theory X toolkit, we can very clearly see why. So we we'll talk about coercion, right? Forced, uh, forced ways of being, micromanagement, implicit threats, right? In, in the case of a job, firing them, tight controls over work, that sort of thing. Um, nonetheless, it's effective in its own right in very uh, certain circumstances. Now, on the other hand, theory Y attitude, you're assuming that most people are competent and they are creative enough to essentially fix their own problems and achieve the goals that they were uh, tasked with. You, you also have a more positive overview in that um, people are capable of handling, handling responsibility and it's because you, know, you see them as being uh, committed not only to the quality of the job, uh, but also because it's they feel like it's satisfying their higher needs. And by needs, we, we're talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, you're also viewing people in a way that um, there's they can be self-directed, where you don't need such tight levels of control um, and really, you can just allow people to naturally um, organize themselves and work it out. And of course, you know, if you're, th this is equally applicable when we talk about, uh, you know, 
adults versus children. Toolkit, same, apply, uh, same toolkit applies, but you'll use it based on the situation and circumstances. So when we take a look at the 3Y toolkit, you'll find most of it is um, hands off, very, um, very decentralized. So decentralized method of command, a lot of delegating of tasks, um, enlarging the, by job enlargement, we're talking about not scope creep, but we are talking about explaining uh, and helping people understand and assuming that people also understand how their one project or their task is really um, interconnected in this whole giant machine and system as opposed to you know being isolated and not involved in any way so um, and it also makes heavy use of participative management where you're actively uh, seeking out feedback from uh, and, and engagement from your team members as opposed to um, uh, waiting uh, or forcing waiting for a response from them or forcing them to give a response. It's much more natural. Now, Moen, uh, interestingly enough, uh, Oichi, so again, he was a uh, American uh, researcher and it was at the time where the Japanese auto automakers were really outshining uh, American automakers. Uh, and when we talk about Oichi's theory Z, really what he's doing is he's taking a sort of hybrid of the two, but expanding on it even more. And um, a theory Z attitude is really emphasizing that uh, employees across the entire organization, when you give them a high degree of freedom and trust, they're going to do the right thing. And they're going to take responsibility and they're effectively going to self-organize. And not only because it's in their own best interest, but because they see it as in the best interest of um, others as well as the company to do quality work. It emphasizes um, consensual decision making, long term employment, slow sometimes and data driven evaluation and promotion, as well as more holistic and humanistic concern of employees. You're not just looking at people as well, people hate work, they only do it for money. Therefore, you have to control them. And, you know, on the other extreme, you know, people are always, every time, uh, always committed to quality and doing their best. And you just totally never uh, engage them anyway. And they'll do their own thing in a instructive manner to the company and the team. This is more realistic. You know, this is really how it is just about everywhere. And um, the holistic part of it is that you you uh, if we go back just really quickly to Hertzberg's uh, dual factor theory, right? All of these things are uh, one of the criticisms we talked about was how it's focused on um, contextual factors just for the individual. Well, and it neglects environmental factors for what's going on in society and the world at large. Theory Z really um, turns out on its head and it adds that missing component where, you know, you, you talk about uh, you know, uh, not only what's going on in the world, but what's going on potentially in the lives of uh, the individuals that make up your team and your organization. You know, you're really getting to know your customers on an intimate level rather than doing nonsensical um, Surveys, you're doing a lot of research in understanding, you know, how is it that digital transformation is really impacting supply chain? Why is it that we need a UNS architecture built on the four principles of report by exception, lightweight, open architecture, right? Why is it that we need to do it this way versus our point to point um, integration? That's really where uh, Theory Z. Uh, frameworks shine and are able to do some of that deeper dive. It also has a much higher bias for action, even though sometimes that bias can be uh, more dependent in valuing of data to show why we should do something. It is still a bias for action as opposed to a lot of the methods that uh, people are familiar with, with plan, do, check, act, right? The Deming way of um, sequential waterfall project management. Um, 
We talked a little bit about this, right? Implicit and explicit biases in project management. All this to say, um, biases do not just come from culture. It's really driven by physiological uh, responses, which is to say that uh, you have to have a mastery of neuroscience, you know, understand what potential um, events, uh, what potential uh, incidents people might have come across before and how they view uh, the project, the world today at large, right? You need to understand those things if you want to have a successful outcome. These biases exist not out of thin air, but oftentimes through subconscious means. And it's bringing those subconscious things into uh, the forefront and exploring them to help people, help train people out of certain negative uh, purviews and working towards a common goal and learning a new adaptive uh, way of being. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about bias overall, especially in project management. Um, one of the ways that you can really quickly identify bias in project management is before the actual project even starts. You know, if we look at, uh, if you recall in our first uh, video about project, man what is project management, right? The charter actually marks the birth of the project, but the business case document is where you can actually uh, start seeing potential avenues where bias will um, rear its head implicitly or explicitly, right? Because business case documents are really just taking a look at the problem at large. They are not at provo they're not proposing a solution. Mm -hmm. There is no time bound anything. There's no budget or sponsor or anything like that, right? Doesn't formally exist at all as a project. But it shows how people are viewing the problem at hand. Is it really true that that is the problem? Or is it currently just how the organization or the team thinks about the problem? That will definitely give you a huge window into um, further, not only further complications on the road, but potential uh, lenses of bias that you as an individual, uh, your team, your organization as a whole might be viewing something. So the business case documents is a great, great place to go always for getting a uh, uh, a kickstart on understanding some of these biases. This is a slide. Um, I actually want to dive, do a little deeper dive into. Uh, now I've so, I've shown before, right, the different organizational uh, structure types, and I just want to do a deeper dive and um, sort of explain not uh, e each of these columns and um, each of the structure types. Again, the most important takeaway here is that there is no such thing as the best organizational structure. You adapt the structure as well as your management techniques that best fit your needs at the present moment, and you simply iterate accordingly. You might have heard continuous improvement. This is a facet of that. Until such time that you reach a lighthouse moment, right? Where, you know, we take a look at our innovation graph sort of an S and it plateaus at some point. And then the uh, lighthouse moment is where innovation occurs, where it's the uh, same game, but the rules are totally different. You jump up a step. That is what um, still applies today. And I just wanted to, um, to, to uh, uh, readdress that here. Another thing, again, you know, just to reiterate, What's different from humans in particular to all other life forms is that it's our we we are, we have the uh, innate ability to instantaneously create and change social structures to meet the current need. Meaning, what we do today is a function of what we know how to do now. But as we, you know, create new things and do the work, we're going to learn along the way. And it means we need to uh, adapt and change along the way. And so those two things I want you to keep at the forefront. And those are the two lenses you should be viewing this chart from. Because if you cannot view it from those, then this chart really just becomes more of a, well, which one is the best one? And it's 
not at all uh, what, what this chart is intended to do. So now that we have that, if we take a look at this list, at the top left we see organic or simple. A lot of times you'll see this type of um, dominance hierarchy uh, within startup uh, companies where people are wearing many different hats. Uh, there might not necessarily be a lot of expectations on one person to meet certain specific tasks. We just know that the end goal is X and really people are allowed to uh, self-organize and achieve that. What it means for a project manager, again, because there's no real defined dominance hierarchy, they don't really have uh, an authoritative role. Um, they might not even be existent in the company. And uh, whether it best, it, whether you need one or not really depends on um, areas that you've, um, as a leader, as well as a project uh, team member, have seen as a need that other folks have might uh, just not able to rise to the occasion because they might not have those project management um, skills to help resolve those issues. That's uh, primarily where you see the sort of organic or simple uh, structure, or as I'm really more apt to like to call it, dominance hierarchy. When we take a look at the uh, the next one, functional, this is specific task, specific responsibility, and you're limited to just that task, right? You have a safety engineer that specifically handles checking safety PLCs at a specific point in time, and that's all they do. That's all they do. What do they report to? You know, they report to functional manager. Uh, and uh, is there really a need for a project manager? A lot of times, no. Um, oftentimes, not even necessary. That person or persons who have that specific job title carry out that task, they do it routinely, and there's no need for supervision um, outside of them reporting, letting others know that you know the, the functional task was done. Um, as you sort of climb up in, um, sometimes you, you and you know, I, I also wanna make the distinction here that it's not like these are uh, going up or down in uh, organizational size. Right, so it's not like when you go from organic to functional, you're increasing your corporate size. It's not um, guaranteed at all. Um, but really, what it means is that, you know, a lot of times you'll see some uh, structures in some environments versus others. So when we talk about uh, multi-divisional, right, uh, a lot of times this is a company that's just selling many products of a similar pr uh, product family line. Um, and there's not really much actual project management or projects occurring. They already have their products and they just um, need assistance with managing the uh, production of the products. And they already have the means to produce those products um, down pat. So, you know, they might have a distribution center here, but their actual production facility is elsewhere. Um, do they really need a project manager for that? Or can it simply be, again, you know, in this case, a functional manager that oversees one task of the delivery and then another one who simply sees the task of the, uh, the consumption of the raw goods and then another task of, you know, safety engineer uh, managing the safety of the production of that good or goods. Uh, another function, uh, another dominant hierarchy you might see is a strong matrix where uh, people are organized by their job function and project management is a job function, right? Uh, people are doing, this is often the case where you see people doing operational work and those people are uh, separated from project work, where oftentimes you might bring in outside uh, vendors to actually do dedicated project work. And you have other staff that are doing operational work, right? Day-to-day -day maintenance tasks. In this case, project manager has a very high level of authority. 
uh, and rightfully so, right? If they're being brought on for a project, it means time bound, it's unique. There's a specific uh, budget allocated just to that project. Weak matrix, on the other hand, um, it's a similar to a strong matrix, but really um, weak in the sense when we talk about strong, it's not you know strong as in it's better. It just means that the level of authority of a project manager, right? Strong matrix organization, you'll see project manager having a higher authority than not. Um, same thing with the balanced. Uh, interesting one out of these is the project oriented. So really, uh, oftentimes you only see this with construction companies, you know, general contractors, they essentially live and die by um, project work, right? They're brought on to do a project, they build it. That's pretty much it. Sometimes if they're, um, if they might have some vertically integrated uh, services, you know, um, building services, uh, consulting services, that sort of thing. They might be brought on for that. Otherwise, though, uh, most of the time, you know, they're brought on just to do a project. That's primarily where you see it. Um, then let's see here. Uh, you'll have uh, virtual work. So, you know, this is uh, very common now with, uh, you know, virtual uh, team members. The fact that a lot of our team members are scattered all over the world uh, can make it very difficult. You know, hierarchies, responsibilities, expectations, who has um, authority. It can be challenging. It's very, very varied, to say the least. The PMO, it's it's a difficult one. Um, we'll actually cover it in the next slide. But the PMO, aka the Project Management Office, has changed quite a bit over the years. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, talk about it. So the formal definition of a PMO, right? Very <laughs> convoluted. I mean, I've, I've read it through it a couple of times, but uh, organizational structure that standardizes the project related governance processes and facilitates the sharing of resources, methodologies, tools, and techniques. Um, it's quite a handful. There's a lot of PMI isms in there. And, um, you know, you can read through some of the slides here, but really what I want to highlight here is a couple is really two things. You know, there's three really types of a PMO supportive controlling directive. They do their own thing, namely supportive. Um, they're more or less like information brokers. They don't really have any authority. They give you access to resources like kind of like a library. Controlling, um, oftentimes they might be a com uh, regulatory compliance body within the company, and you have to use a specific template or form, especially if you do business in some areas, just because of the fact that you know there's legal consequences if you don't. Um, and then directive is they have it's it's more like uh, bringing in consultants, but your consultants your consultants are internal. And you're sectioning out a group of people that normally have, you know, functional job tasks and responsibilities. But for this a lot of period of time, they're going to forego those responsibilities and only look at uh, this particular project work. Really, how a, a PMO came about is um, prior to the day age, uh, the the day and age of the internet era, uh, you needed to have information and communications brokers because real-time communications were essentially non-existent you know you needed to essentially have uh, somebody riding on horseback more or less and letting people know that the project work is done or the project work in this is in this particular phase uh, that's really why it existed i think the thing a lot of organizations are struggling with now is justifying the existence of a pmo do we actually need it and frankly, I have yet to see a PMO be effectively utilized in this day and age, primarily due to factors in digital transformation, right? People are uh, empowered to be self-reliant and seek out their own information. So do they really need this uh, entity that you're actively funding and paying money for 
where uh, where instead people can just seek out their own information. Uh, you know, it's 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 really hard to in this day and age justify the existence of a PMO. I think a lot of times you'll see it transformed again into a regulatory compliance body, where out of sheer legal necessity they exist, but they don't really do much work other than that. Um, oftentimes, it's the work of a PMO is often outsourced. It's not called a PMO specifically, but you might see it again uh, as some sort of management consulting uh, specifically for either some to do a some uh, market research analysis or to do um, again some sort of regulatory compliance work. But even the folks that do uh, contract out this PMO work of market research, a lot of that is going away, and I think rightfully so, thanks to digital transformation. Everybody has access to real-time information, and they can historize it. And for themselves, they can see not only how their company is doing, but relative to others. How are those companies doing? It's it's tough, you know? The, the days of the PMO, um, I think, personally, are rightfully dwindling down and it had a purpose. It served that purpose when it was necessary and appropriate. But um, I, I think, you know, a PMO will continue existing, just not in the same way that we're sort of used to. I think by and large, you're just going to see it exclusively be utilized as a regulatory compliance uh, type of structure. And oftentimes it might not even be internally. So, you know, just things to keep in mind. So if you made it this far, we're at the conclusion. Um, and I always like to leave a little slide here as a pop quiz. Um, and what we'll we'll go ahead and through each of these just very briefly. So, and uh, I'll refer to the slides for where you can find this information. So, you know, just to recap, you know, we learned about the uh, Tuckman's stages of group development. We learned about the parts of the brain. We'll learn about some social psychologists. Uh, we'll learn about bio biases, and we learned about how our nervous system operates, right? These are really the things that at the core make up leadership management, right? Neuroscience is driving uh, the understanding of leadership and management, not platitudes, not vapid, you know, useless uh, uh, co comments about you know how somebody should or shouldn't be, but really driven at the core of uh, physiological responses, how those physiological responses affect behavior, drive thoughts, so on and so forth, right? So taking a look at the first one, uh, the Tuckman stages of group development, we have this beautiful picture. Um, but the thing you won't see here is the iterative part. So hopefully you can pick up on that, right? So obviously, you know, I mentioned before, you can go through these in sequential order, but just after performing here is the iterative step of norming and renorming, where you, you know, what you know now is a function of what you've done. So that's why there's that iterative part of um, the stages of group development. three parts of the brain. So this is all the way back to here. So we have a cortex and of course, you know, there's more parts of the cortex. There's our reptilian brain and our limbic system. Three why management means extreme control and discipline of employees, true or false. You should obviously answer false. And we'll go ahead and uh, this is McGregor we're talking about. All right, if we take a look at the toolkit, it's actually decentralization and delegation. And you believe people are self-directed and uh, can align their work with uh, the organization's uh, goals. What is the purpose of the business case documents? We actually uh, mentioned this a little bit earlier, but it is to quickly understand bias, both implicit and explicit. 
And lastly, name the two nervous systems. So this would be PNS, CNS. And here we have our the way that the information travels. I believe though the uh, PNS, CNS, right here, Neuroscience 101. Great. I hope this video was helpful. I know it was quite a lot of information, but now you truly have a foundational, the foundational knowledge to understand uh, human behavior individually and collectively. And, you know, understanding it from a scientific point of view, true empirical evidence, as opposed to cultural anecdotes or, you know, vapid platitudes you might have heard. Um, this is really what's driving management and leadership. And the folks that are effective. Le uh, leaders are also effective managers and the folks that are truly effective managers are also effective leaders you need all of this and you need a mastery of neuroscience uh, and you know human psychology social psychology uh, brain development to be able to really key in and use some of these frameworks uh, appropriately and situationally so stay tuned for the next video and i will see you guys on the next one all right.